We continue in our look at Samson this morning, and we are in Judges chapter 16, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 22. We'll finish up chapter 16 next week. Judges 16, verses 1 through 22. One day Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there, so the men of Gaza gathered together and waited all night at the town gates. They kept quiet during the night, saying to themselves, when the light of morning comes, we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, and lifted them up, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders, carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to, give you, to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Samson replied, If I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, I would become as weak as anyone else. So the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings, and she tied Samson up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house. And she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the bowstrings as a piece of string snaps when it is burned by a fire. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterward, Delilah said to him, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, If I were tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. The men were hiding in the inner room as before, and again Delilah cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But again Samson snapped the ropes from his arms as if they were thread. Then Delilah said, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, If you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric on your loom and tighten it with a loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. So while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric. Then she uh, tightened it with the loom shuttle. Again she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson woke up, pulled back the loom shuffle, and yanked his hair away from the loom and the fabric. Then Delilah pouted. How can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now. You've got to put the wine in here, otherwise you don't get it. And, and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Now, again, the Bible accurately records things. It's not prescribing that, okay? Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth. So she sent for the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, she said, for he's finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap. And then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down, and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I'll do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. This guy is an interesting fellow, isn't he? Um, Samson is a guy who is wonderfully gifted, and he seems to squander everything he's been given. He is a man who, who was called by God to do the work of God, and he spends his life living by his hormones and seeking revenge. He is a mystery. 
in this passage, things come to a head. Um, this is the final part of the Samson story. Next week will be the, the, the ending. The credits will roll after next week. But we start off here, before we get to Delilah, who's it's probably the most famous part of the Samson story. Samson and Delilah, lots of movies been made on this, all kinds of stuff. We've got this odd account in Gaza, but there's some things you need to realize here. Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza, spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread. Samson was there. The men of Gaza gathered together, waited all night at the town gates, keeping quiet, saying to themselves, when the light of the morning comes, we're going to get this guy. Because remember, he's public enemy number one right now. Because as Rick pointed out last week, he had destroyed their crops with the foxes. He had slayed a thousand um, men with the jawbone of, a, of an ox or the donkey. And Samson is in town. They're going to get him, but he only stays till midnight. Apparently, there was only one way out of this town. So he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, lifted them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron. Now, there's some questions with this story. Number one, why did he go to a Philistine town to start with? He's public enemy number one, and he goes waltzing into this town that's walled. So there's no way for him to get out apart from going through the city gate, which was closed at night. Second, why rip out the gates? How did he get to the gates? All these guys are waiting at the gates for him. How did he get to the gate? Did he slay those people? It doesn't say. Were they asleep, resting up for the morning? Did God put them into a little bit of a stupor? Don't know. <laughs> He carried the gates to the hill across from Hebron, which is 40 miles away. How can some guy carry the gates of a city 40 miles away? Supernatural strength. But that, that begs the question, why would you carry the gates? I mean, haven't you kind of made your point once you've gone 100 yards or so? Why carry it 40 miles? I don't, I don't understand. Why would he take such a risk? Um, Tim Keller, in his book on Judges, writes this. The more God blessed Samson, giving him strength to fight his foes, the more Samson grew confident of his own invulnerability. The more he engaged in irresponsible behavior. In other words, Samson's heart used God's blessing as a reason to forget God. There's a danger in this for all of us. Um, some of you who remember these days, and this, this is weird to say this, um, when Bill Clinton was president, and he had this run-in with, with a woman, Monica Lewinsky, and it threatened to take down his presidency. And, and a long time after that, uh, Dan Rather was talking to the president. He was out of office, and and he said to him the inevitable question, why? Why would you engage in behavior that threatened your presidency, that undermined some of the good things you wanted to do, and threatened the health of your marriage? And you have to respect President Clinton because he was honest. He said, I, I guess all I have is the most mor morally indefensible reason of all, because I could. That was it. I was just acting out of arrogance. And, and this, is what, this is what he's doing here. This is what Samson is doing. He is being reckless, reckless disregard. And that takes us to Delilah. Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong, how he can be overpowered, tied up securely. And each of us, so this is, each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So there's five kings, so that's 5,500 pieces of silver, which was an enormous amount. This woman would be set for life with this amount of money. They wanted the secret of his strength. Now, I mentioned it a few weeks ago. If Samson was this guy that we usually picture, 
this, this humongous giant of a man, why did they want to know what the secret of his strength was? You would, wouldn't you be able to tell? This guy's a workout junkie. This guy's got muscles that don't quit. So again, maybe this guy is kind of dweeby like me or like some of you. You know, we're just, just a normal guy. And he, and, he, and he keeps showing all this strength. And so the Philistines are going, this doesn't make any sense. Tell us what the secret of his strength is. So Delilah... Delilah's willing to use Samson. In fact, they're using each other. There's no real love here. Samson is, is using Delilah for his pleasures. Delilah is using Samson to get a bunch of money, to be able to retire and to get that villa in the country that she wanted. So these people are just using each other. And she takes the direct approach. She just comes to him and says, Hey, how'd you get to be so strong? What's the secret of your strength? Now, the question we want to ask again is, Samson, do you see a problem developing here? Why are you not running for your life? Why are you not, why are you cooperating with this woman? She's obviously trying to take you down. He doesn't care. Could just be that she was very, very attractive, and men around very, very attractive women sometimes lose their mind. And, and, and maybe that's what's happening here. I don't know. So Samson starts to play with her. The first thing he says, we tie me up with bowstrings, which were really attendants from a, a dead animal that were dried, and that doesn't work. And then it's the ropes, and that's this whole loom thing. Again, we're asking a question. How, how did she go about tying him up? It, it sure seems like each time... Maybe this guy was one sleepy dude. I don't know, um, because she keeps saying, you know, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. It's almost like he's, he's waking up, isn't it? So, so he tells her this, and then he falls asleep, and he must have been a really hard sleeper, because she ties him up all these times. I mean, it, it's a bizarre story. And then finally, she nags him to the point where he tells her the truth. Again, let me quote Tim Keller. Because Keller asks some uh, good questions here. He says this, It is truly strange that Samson did not leave after telling Delilah the truth. Instead, he went to sleep on her lap. Wouldn't you have thought that since you told her three things before, and when you fell asleep she did them, you would think that if you fall asleep now, she's going to cut your hair? Apparently not. Why? Because he did not really believe that his hair or his Nazarite vow was the source of his strength. He had come to believe that his strength was simply his. That no matter what he did or how he lived, he would not lose it. His self-deception was not just psychological but theological. Samson was unable to see how dependent he was on God's grace. He had come to see his strength as an inalienable right, not a gift of God's mercy. Samson had presumed that nothing could hurt him. And how sad is it when we get to uh, verse 20? She wakes him up. And he says to himself, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. See, Samson was right. The strength really wasn't in his hair. It was, it was from God. And Samson had been continually just snubbing his nose at the vows that he had taken. Don't touch dead bodies. Don't engage with alcohol. Don't cut your hair. When he cut his hair, all three of them had been violated. And it was almost as if God said, fine. And the Spirit left him with tragic consequences. He's captured, and his eyes are gouged out. He's, he's put to work like a, a common animal, grinding the grain. As you know, the, the Philistines aren't content to just kill him. They want to humiliate him for all that he has done. Now, 
like I said, we're going to finish the story next week because I think it's, it's good to stop here and say this is such an odd story. What, what are we supposed to be taking out of it? And I think the thing that we should be learning is about temptation. And I want to give you some principles related to temptation. Any compromise, any kind of compromise opens the door to temptation. Now, a lot of things that we say, you know, this is it's no big deal. It's a minor thing. There are no such things as minor things. Everything we do that's a step away from what God has told us to do is moving us out into the target area for temptation. Lots of things. Let me give you a list of some things. Um, We choose to lie or shade the truth. We call it a, a white lie as opposed to a black lie, I guess. We decide God's instructions regarding morality are outdated. We choose to forego worship, to do something else that's more important. When we neglect prayer and Bible reading, when we refuse to forgive, when we ignore people who we know are in need, when we gossip, when we justify rather than confess our sins. Each one of these things is a step away from the Lord. And every time we take a step away from the Lord, we're becoming more and more vulnerable. Second, toying with temptation is to ask for failure. The Bible tells us that when we face temptation, we should flee temptation. Get out of there. Don't play with this. And we go back to the story of Joseph. When Potiphar's wife was trying to seduce him and say, hey, nobody will ever know. It'll be wonderful. You have no idea how great. And, And he ran leaving his coat behind. That's what we're supposed to do. Run. Get out of there. Don't try, to, don't try to play with Satan like that because you are overmatched. But instead, we're the kind of people who go, you know, I, I, I think I get a little bit closer to the edge. I'm just going to keep, you know, I, if, if, I'm, I, haven't, I, haven't cro- I haven't done anything wrong yet. And we see how close we can get before we get into trouble. That's kind of like playing Russian roulette. Um, you know, that's the game where you empty a revolver and put in one bullet in the chamber. Then you spin the chamber, point it at your head, and pull the trigger. What a foolish game to play. Now, the odds are in your favor. Only one chamber actually has a bullet in it. But why would you play that game? Same thing here. Why play with temptation? There are times when we say, Why did God let this happen? You know, sometimes God had nothing to do with it. God didn't let it happen. You played with that. You you started that fire. You created that mess. God had nothing to do with it. But he will be there to help you pick up the pieces if you let him. Third, temptation comes in enticing packages. Because if it didn't, it wouldn't tempt us, would it? Remember the garden with Adam and Eve? Said, boy, this, this fruit looks good. It, it looked good. And Satan said, not only does it look good, what it's going to do is it's going to make you smart, and it's going to give you a perspective. You're going to be as smart as God is. That's why he doesn't want you to read it, eat it, because he doesn't want you to be competition. They go, oh, it's good, and they'll make us powerful. <laughs> If Delilah was an unattractive woman to Samson, it wouldn't have been much of a temptation. Satan's smart. He knows the things that will entice us. He knows the things that will get our interest. He knows how to get us. Let me give you a list in case you don't believe me. He'll tempt us with the applause of our friends. I'll be able to fit in if I do this a chance to make money. A desirable man or woman shows an interest in you and you go, oh, I guess I still have it. The promise of a promotion. The snob appeal of gaining on other people with a chance to get even with someone. Remember the story of the Trojan horse? Uh, The Greeks were supposedly uh, surrounding Troy and they couldn't get in because it's a walled city. And they're frustrated, so they decide, 
We got an idea. So they build this humongous horse on wheels. And they roll the horse up to the gate of the city, and then they leave. Now, you would think that the people in Troy would go, eh, there's something fishy about this. But no, I'm guessing the city planner came up and said, you know what? If that horse was inside here, that would increase tourist revenue. And if we bring that, people will come from miles around to see this horse. It would be fantastic. What? We could build restaurants around? I mean, you can almost hear them saying this. So they open the door. They, they pull the Trojan horse into the city. They shut the gate. That night, the behind of the horse lifts up. The Greek army comes out of it and slays them. That's what temptation's like. That which looks attractive on the outside can be really deadly. Then... I want you to see that the person who feels they can handle it is especially vulnerable. The people who say it could never happen to me. That's what happened to Samson, isn't it? He says it could never happen to me. I, I can give her all kinds of things. I'm never going to grow weak. I am always going to defeat the Philistines. I, it's, it's just my gift. There's that sense in which we can feel I'll give you a personal example. For years, I counseled with people who were going through divorces. I counseled with people in marriage counseling. And, and as I saw some of the horrible things going on in people's lives, there was this part of me that says, you know, I'm glad I read all those marriage books. I'm glad I've had all this experience. I'm glad that I am committed to my marriage because otherwise this might happen to me. In essence, I was saying, this could never happen to me. But it did. And I think we need to be on guard and recognize that kind of like soldiers, when, when soldiers are fighting, they have to stay behind their, their shields. They need to stay behind. They need to stay out of cover. I mean, they need to stay under cover and shoot from behind places that will defend them. And the reckless person who says, I don't have to do that because I can take them on, who comes out in the open, now becomes a priority target. And you need to understand, Satan is a really good shot. And once we start letting our guard down, and we start thinking, this could never happen to me, a couple things happen. One, we become vulnerable. Second, we become horribly self-righteous. What I mean by that is, is if you find yourself talking about how horrible somebody is, oh, those, that's horrible what they're doing. The implication being, that would never happen to me. You start pointing your fingers, you start picking up your rocks, you start making your posters of protest. Be very careful. Be very careful because in essence you are saying, this could never happen to me. And you are standing away from your defense and you're becoming a target. Because when you are self-righteous, we are trusting in our own strength rather than his. I think it's true that when we see things going on in other people's lives, we should constantly remind ourselves that there, truly but for the grace of God, really could be me. And instead of throwing rocks at those people, maybe I need to be working on my own life and and strengthening my own defenses lest I fall. If it could happen to them, you know, it could happen to me. We've learned a lot from Samson. Um, He teaches us that our strength can be lost, that victories do not make us invincible, that only the Lord can keep us safe when we face temptation. Only He can give us strength in the time of tragedy to learn from the hard times and come back to the Lord. Maybe, maybe you don't need this warning. Maybe you're one of those people who was wounded. You've fallen. You've made mistakes. you felt the judgment and the wrath of the self-righteous people. Maybe you've drifted from the Lord and you're picking up the pieces. Learn from Samson. 
At the end of his life, after all the foolish choices he made, God made his hair grow again. He was restored to the Lord and given the opportunity to finish the job that God gave him to do. I believe that God can do the same for us. I believe he can pick up broken people and he can restore them. But first, we've got to be smart. We've got to be smart about temptation. We've got to take it seriously, and we need to take the defenses that he gives to us. Let's pray together. Father, please help us to learn from Samson. It's easy for us to talk about how stupid he was and miss the fact that sometimes we are just as reckless in our lives. So, Lord, please, you have told us that there is no temptation that will come our way except that which you have also provided a way out from. So instead of indulging, instead of playing, instead of getting so close to the edge, instead of becoming mean and self-righteous and hard, help us to hide ourselves in you. And, Lord, when we see someone who is caught up in the, the throes of sin, Help us not to kick them, but to give them a hand and help them get back on their feet. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.